Let's get started on today's Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium. I want to welcome everybody uh, to the first Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium of the year. Um, my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm a professor of medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital um, and Harvard Medical School, and I am the director of the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law, um, which uh, has the honor of uh, helping organize and co-hosting these um, Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium with the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. Um, and uh, if you are want to uh, tweet about anything that uh, that you hear about or see about um, or see on this uh, in this talk, um, you use the hashtag hashtag policy ethics that you can see there, um, and you can have a you get a conversation going over Twitter. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background on on this uh, or the organization of this uh, portal. The the group that I run is a research center focused on studying the intersection of law, therapeutics, um, and regulation and public health. Um, we are an interdisciplinary group with uh, experts in um, medicine and business, law, ethics, um, epidemiology, uh, and and um, we run courses at the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. Um, as well as the School of Public Health uh, and down at Yale also um, at their uh, law school and School of Public Health. If you want to learn more about Portal, you can go to our website at portalresearch.org, uh, but you can see there at the bottom um, recent articles and um, blogs that we've authored. Um, and, uh, you know, we also try to get involved in, in a lot of uh, policymaking and, uh, and policy discussions around um, the issues relating to the pharmaceutical market and other regulated products. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at portal underscore research, and you can join our mailing list um, by checking us out on our website or going to this, um, this short uh, um, website. Um, so one of the things that we've done uh, at, at Portal uh, for the last five years is, um, is organize these consortia, um, which occur monthly uh, on the second Friday of every month during the uh, academic year. Um, the goals of the consortium are to articulate key issues in the healthcare system, uh, and public health that involve ethically challenging policies or practices um, to bring together experts with different perspectives or experiences to consider um, and propose solutions to these issues um, and to stimulate conversation and further academic study that will um, advance the field. And uh, just to give you a, um, a little bit of a taste of the policy and ethics consortia to come, uh, in October, we'll be talking about drug shortages. Uh, in November, um, concussions in youth sports. Uh, and then in December, um, accessing experimental drugs uh, and stem cell treatments. Um, and uh, so for today's session, um, which is a, a fantastic session, very, uh, couldn't be more timely and we couldn't have better, um, better speakers to share with you. I want to um, first introduce um, our moderator, uh, Leah Rand, who uh, is a postdoctoral fellow um, in the portal group. Leah got her a doctorate in Applied Ethics from uh, the University of Oxford and studies intersections between bioethics and healthcare um, with a focus on justice, fairness, and healthcare access. And uh, apropos to this topic in particular, um, before she was at Portal, um, she worked at the uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine and helped uh, write a book about public health emergency preparedness. Um, and so uh, Leah is going to introduce uh, the topics for today uh, and introduce our guest experts as well. Um, so take it away, Leah. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, so our topic today needs little introduction since the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the pandemic have affected all of us, changing how we live day to day, interact, and affecting the health of millions of people around the world. So as of this morning, there have been over 20 million confirmed cases and 900,000 deaths globally. Now, of the many issues and topics relevant to COVID-19, today we're focusing on the challenge of making decisions when there is uncertainty. Uncertainty about the pandemic and its future impacts and moral uncertainty about what actions are right to take. We can characterize the pandemic context as one of great uncertainty and rapidly changing information. Since December, what we know about how the virus is spread, who is at greatest risk, and how to reduce transmission has changed and improved. Meanwhile, there's ongoing research to develop pharmaceutical interventions, including treatments and vaccines. And against the backdrop of this uncertainty is an urgent need for action at the federal and state levels to protect health. In different countries and US states, we've seen different policies and responses to whether and when to close borders, restrict travel, require masks, 
and one in how to reopen businesses and schools. So in public health ethics, there's the so-called precautionary principle, which is often invoked to highlight that uncertainty is, um, cannot justify inaction when there are risks of serious harms, or put another way, when there is a serious threat of harm, reasonable cost-effective interventions to prevent that harm should be enacted, even if we are not confident in the available information. But with COVID-19, we've seen a divergence on what people think are reasonable interventions, and even on what the greatest harm is, whether it's the direct health loss, economic impacts, or restrictions on individuals' liberties that could result from the virus or the actions taken to prevent its spread. So two ways to approach these challenges and decisions will be the focus of our discussion today. How we know and think about what will happen and how we decide what actions ethically should be taken. Guiding policy decisions so far has been the work of epidemiologists analyzing data and using models to predict the future trajectory of the pandemic and the likely effectiveness of interventions to reduce transmission. Models can, provi <clears throat> models can provide valuable predictions of what will happen, but there have also been notable examples of models that under overestimated um, the impact of the virus early on, bringing the resulting policy decisions into question. Models will continue to play an important role in managing the response to COVID-19 and informing future acts, actions. So how should policymakers make decisions on the basis of model predictions? In addition to needing to make decisions when information is limited, policy decisions like whether to require quarantines or close businesses face moral uncertainty. What are the acceptable trade-offs between liberty, livelihoods, and protecting the public's health? And if that wasn't a big enough question to ask, uh, the pandemic has made us debate how to allocate healthcare resources with new guidelines for who should be prioritized for ICU beds and ventilators if hospitals are overwhelmed with cases. Now we're beginning to consider who should be vaccinated first once a safe and effective vaccine is developed. These are big questions about what we owe each other that have been asked for centuries, but they're especially urgent right now. So I'm glad that here to share their thoughts and expertise are Drs. Mark Lipsitch and Matt Winia. Dr. Lipsitch is Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard University T.H. Chan School of Public Health with a joint appointment in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases. He directs the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics. His research concerns the effect of naturally acquired host immunity, vaccine-induced immunity, and other public health interventions like antimicrobial use on the population biology of pathogens and the consequences of changing pathogen populations for human health. He is an author of more than 300 peer-reviewed publications on antimicrobial resistance, epidemiologic methods, mathematical modeling of infectious disease transmission, pathogen population genomics, and immunoepidemiology of streptococcus pneumoniae. Dr. Lipsitch is a prominent voice in the novel coronavirus research community with six peer-reviewed publications and four manuscripts currently under review on the topic. He has also been active in science communication on the subject with a dozen op-eds published since the start of the outbreak. Dr. Lipsitch received his BA summa cum laude in philosophy from Yale and his DPhil from Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He did postdoctoral work at Emory University and the CDC. Honors include mentoring awards from Harvard Chan, the Robert Austrian Lectureship, and the election to the American Academy of Microbiology. Following him will be Dr. Winia, who is director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado and professor of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. His training is in internal medicine, infectious diseases, public health, and health services research. From 1997 to 2015, Dr. Winio worked at the American Medical Association, AMA, where he developed a research institute and training programs focused on bioethics, professionalism, and policy issues at the AMA Institute for Ethics and founded the AMA Center for Patient Safety. He also practiced at the University of Chicago. His research has focused on understanding and improving the practical management of ethical issues in medicine and public health. He has led projects on a wide variety of issues related to ethics and professionalism. He has served on committees and expert panels and is a reviewer for the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies, the Joint Commission, Federal Agencies, the Hastings Center, the American Board of Medical Specialties, and other organizations. He has delivered and held more than two dozen named lectures and visiting professorships nationally and internationally. Dr. Winnie is the author of more than 140 published articles, chapters, and essays. His work has been published in numerous leading medical ethics and medical and ethics journals, and he is a contributing editor of the American Journal of Bioethics. He is past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, 
and has chaired the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association and the Ethics Committee of the Society of General Internal Medicine. He holds current board certifications in internal medicine and infectious diseases. So I'm delighted to welcome the both of you to speak with us today. Doctors Lipsich and Winnie will each present and that will be followed by a moderated Q&A session. So at the bottom of your screens, you can see a button for Q&A and please type your questions into the box and we look forward to hearing what you have to ask and, and hearing from Drs. Lipsich and Winnie. Sorry, shall I begin? Yeah. Now I can't hear. Yes, you can begin. Okay, yes. sorry, little Zoom hiccup there. Um, you'd think by now. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Aaron and Leah and colleagues for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think uh, ethical issues and the sort of decision quandaries that we face are uh, underappreciated dimensions of this pandemic. Um, I think uh, ethical dilemmas arise a lot in any crisis. Um, better decision making can make certain kinds of ethical dilemmas disappear because uh, they arise sometimes from the bad decisions that we've made in the past. And I think that's a theme that I'm not sure if I'll directly touch on, but has been very striking that the decisions become harder as the policy responses become worse and conversely, uh, better decisions under uncertainty not only are themselves an ethical contribution, but they also help to prevent, they're sort of preventive medicine for ethics. They're, they're better decisions uh, mean that there are fewer hard problems to solve, uh, I would propose, and we'll see uh, if people agree with that by the end. Um, so uh, after the 2009 flu pandemic, uh, a large group of us held a conference at Harvard School of Public Health where we um, talked about the lessons learned uh, from that pandemic. And I'm going to talk a lot about 2009 in this talk as well as about COVID, in part because we have the classic problem of fighting the last war uh, in thinking about all pandemics and making the lessons learned those that were relevant to the previous one. And we can't do better. We can't know what the future will hold, but we can at least uh, learn from more multiple past pandemics and from the contrasts and maybe in the in the in, in those ways fill in some of the possibilities that we haven't yet experienced so when we talked uh, after 2009 we uh, we discussed what sorts of decisions at the top have to be made uh, in pandemics and uh, what sorts of evidence in the middle uh, might inform those decisions in an ideal setting and uh, what sorts of inputs from basic epidemiology and surveillance might, uh, might inform those, uh, those types of evidence. Uh, and we made a really ugly diagram, which then uh, was improved in a subsequent publication. And, and this is the improved version. And what, you, what it shows is that there are a number of basic uh, pieces of information, number of case counts, various forms of surveillance and outbreak investigations. Um, there are a, a number of uh, approaches to understanding the basic data, which can be synthesized into evidence and then and help to inform decisions. And in a well-functioning public health system, something like this, obviously modified by circumstance, but something like this uh, would be uh, how, how we would react. Um, that has not been the case in this pandemic in the United States, as, as uh, we're all aware we weren't aware, then we're certainly aware after the recent news coverage. But, um, but I think uh, it's important to realize that, that um, it's not just a failure of leadership. Uh, and, and that would be a topic of its own specific to the United States and certain other uh, like-minded countries. Uh, and I don't really want to focus on that, although it's crucial. Because I think as we think about the future and, and of this pandemic and of other pandemics, it's important to understand the sort of structural reasons why even good uh, decision making, uh, well, well intentioned decision making is hard. And the, the reasons largely are, are listed on this slide, which is 
uh, importantly, that every decision has a long lead time before you see its results. So there's a, that means that it's, we need to make them early and we therefore need to make them before we have good evidence about uh, how well they'll work. Um, and these are decisions like vaccine development and purchase, uh, lockdowns and, and other control measures, contact tracing. Um, and this has been true for a long time. Um, the, the classic book by Neustadt and Feinberg on the swine flu, uh, the, the epidemic that never was, as it's also been, as that book has also been titled in other editions. Um, uh, there were many of these issues and uh, we wrote about them also in 2009 um, as that uh, flu pandemic was emerging. So this is not unique here. And these challenges, even with good leadership, would have been real. So in such uh, a setting, we need as many types of inputs as possible to inform our decision making, weighted appropriately, and we could talk about how that might be done. And I think uh, important and often forgotten in the scientific discourse is reasoning from historical analogies. Um, uh, in the case of flu, the, the previous pandemics, in the case of uh, this coronavirus, previous, the previous epidemic of SARS, um, non-pandemic non uh, versions of, of the same viruses, uh, including seasonal coronaviruses, and even other infectious diseases. And these have a lot of lessons. Um, they need to be interpreted carefully, but, they, but we should not forget what we know about the past, because sometimes our models are a little too clever and a little too historically unrooted. Um, clinical and public health experience, of course, uh, and uh, political considerations and the need to do something and be seen to do something, whether or not it's known to be effective. Um, everyone carries an implicit mental model of what's going on and what, what might be the response to interventions and then uh, explicit mathematical models can uh, help to sharpen and hopefully improve, uh, certainly increase confidence, but, uh, but not always even increase confidence, just to, let's say, improve in the best case. And we'll see an example, at least. Um, I think as people who are mostly working as scientists, many of us are used to a sort of um, approach to uncertainty where uh, if we say that our knowledge is inadequate, then the, the answer is to do more science and be agnostic until we know. And scientists uh, are sometimes known and, and even caricatured for being very cautious. And what caution means for scientists in normal times is to avoid type one errors, that is accepting something as true uh, for which the evidence is inadequate. Um, and so we default to agnosticism, but we, uh, and we require a very high standard of proof. When we're doing decision making, where it's not simply a decision, a question of do we believe something is true, but how do we act, then there's no real, the, the, the default to agnosticism doesn't work. The, the consequence of judging a model or, a no, or knowledge of a topic to be inadequate is that we have to rely on something else to make the decision um, because we, we, there is no such thing as just remaining neutral. You have to decide how to respond, even if that is to do nothing. Um, and so caution dictates protecting people and maybe saving money and saving the economy, et cetera. And, and therefore agnosticism is not really an option. It's just paralysis. Um, and uh, I've, I've contrasted these two views, I think, in the, the interesting exchange in the Boston Review that I participated in with Jonathan Fuller and John Ioannidis, um, an interesting discussion for those more in medical ethics and public health ethics is how these types of thinking map onto medical decision making. But I'll leave that aside for now. What I want to talk about uh, mainly, though, is uh, is the challenges, the specific challenges in, in epidemics and some of the things that we do to try to uh, get around those or, or find out if they're really relevant, as relevant as we think. Um, and uh, these are some themes. I'm going to talk about why the data are usually terrible, um, how those limitations can influence our conclusions. Um, I'll talk about a paradox that I uh, 
a big word, fancy word for, it's maybe not a paradox, but a, a surprising thing that I discovered in the last few months. Um, and then I'll talk uh, about evaluation metrics and other considerations outside of, of models uh, that can sometimes help us uh, move forward even when we're not sure. So physical scientists uh, often don't realize how bad and how um, un, uh, unstandardized data from epidemiological models are. So if you do physics or even economics um, or meteorology, you know, you measure the temperature and everybody has a pretty well calibrated instrument. They may be slightly different, but they're, they're pretty much in space and time, you're getting a consistent reading that means the same thing uh, when you see it as it, mean, as, as it meant the day before. And, whoops, and in a crisis especially, but even not in a crisis, epidemiology is, uh, is a bit different. Um, uh, and it's, it's really the analogy I've given, which is a little harder to put on a slide, is it's as if everybody was, every county health department was designing and recalibrating their thermometers every day and you were trying to figure out what the temperature was. Um, uh, uh, we're all using different instruments uh, at every level of geography and, uh, and over time as the testing and et cetera changes. Um, even putting aside the vari variation in what it is we're measuring, there is also the problem of delays. And um, the, the timeline goes for uh, many infections, including this one, from infection to symptoms and then to sometimes to hospitalization, uh, sometimes to ICU admission and death. Um, and uh, each of these has its challenges, which are, are listed below. Um, and in particular, the, the, the events that we observe better because they're more severe and more important, such as deaths, tend to be lagged several weeks uh, from the time of infection. And since we're trying to control infections by our countermeasures, uh, a, a lagged but pretty reliable indicator like death uh, or hospitalization is, um, is good in that it's reliable, but is bad in that it's lagged and makes it harder to do control. Um, and many of us, I think, have sort of settled on hospital admissions as perhaps the best compromise for many purposes. Uh, of what's what's uh, of infection activity, but but um, but it's not far from perfect. Um, the de delay distribution is not even constant. These are uh, the delays from a particular health reporting system, um, from symptom onset to uh, self-reported to uh, to the time of diagnosis to the to the date that the test was performed, um, and you can see. Uh, widely varying and sometimes very long delays. That has consequences for control. And this is uh, the first data that I'm showing from work that we actually did during this pandemic. Um, this is just a, 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 dis a display of the data from Wuhan where, um, where the demand for critical care beds or intensive care beds is shown in orange. The deaths by day are shown in black. So this is a prevalence measure. This is a new new deaths measure. Um, so different types of measures, but um, the the peak demand for critical care or intensive care peaked right around the uh, total capacity per capita of the United States for intensive care in Wuhan, but it peaked exactly a month after the lockdown of January 23rd in Wuhan. So for various reasons, some of which we understand, some of which we don't, the uh, the draconian measure to control the epidemic was here and the at a time when things looked pretty good. I mean, obviously they were bad enough to lock the city down, but there was not a healthcare crisis yet. Um, but by the time it peaked, uh, there was a healthcare crisis. Um, and so this makes control much more challenging. It also makes uh, it much harder to analyze data. And here I'll use an example from the H1N1 epidemic, uh, pandemic of 2009. So um, on May 4th in Mexico, uh, the, the, this disease emerged in late April, early May of 2009. Um, 
the one of the earliest reports, sort of quantitative reports, was that there had been about 500 cases and 19 deaths, or 4% case fatality rate. Um, in the US, on that same day, uh, there had been uh, about 1,000 cases and one death. And uh, because of our experience from the SARS epidemic, we knew that uh, there were two countervailing biases in these data. One was the notion of censoring bias, that we are um, missing deaths that haven't happened yet, meaning some of these people were confirmed yesterday and they're going to die, but they haven't died yet. Um, and on the other hand, especially in Mexico, probably uh, the mild cases were not being detected. And so we were overestimating severity by underestimating the total number of cases when we saw only the severe ones. And so you got uh, in the literature in within 12 days of one another, uh, some colleagues in New Zealand uh, guessed that the uh, at case fatality, the true case fatality rate um, uh, was somewhere well south of 0.1%, maybe considerably further below that, while uh, the Imperial College group estimated uh, that it was probably somewhere between 0.2 and 1.2%. Um, the New Zealand estimate turned out to be correct, um, and it turned out essentially that this, uh, that the, this bias of m not detecting the mild cases was swamping the uh, more moderate bias uh, in the other direction, uh, in that case, opposite of what had happened in SARS, and that's why uh, it was so confusing. Um, uh, the same issue arose at the beginning of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the, this graph in detail, but this is our paper, which we wrote during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa to try to discuss some of these issues of bias in the case fatality risk. Um, and this was a, um, a, an op-ed that the Washington Post asked me to write um, in May, I think it was May, uh, maybe even earlier than May, um, uh, to explain essentially these issues because the numbers were coming out, they were not being very well contextualized and, uh, and it was very strange to essentially adapt an article from PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases uh, to a Washington Post op-ed, but that's more or less uh, what I did. Um, the, there are various ways to try to address these various, these challenges of, of estimating severity. One that we tried in, in 2009 that, that ended up providing a fairly definitive and I think lasting estimate was this sort of idea of gluing different estimates together um, of severity. So, uh, so in that pandemic, the problem was that there was no, it was so mild that there was no jurisdiction that had large enough numbers of deaths to do statistics on and also had really counted very well the, the lower levels of this so-called severity pyramid. So what we did was to, to use uh, different data sources and statistically glue them together in an evidence synthesis framework um, to try to make, make estimates uh, of the risk of dying, um, which are here and under different assumptions get essentially the, the range, the same range that, um, that the New Zealand uh, colleagues had guessed at early, earlier on. <clears throat> this also makes, these delays also make uh, decision making uh, harder um, in that, uh, in that, as we saw with the Wuhan case, there is a delay between when you know about a problem and uh, and re respond to it, and when you uh, and when the problem stops being so bad. Um, so this is some of the early modeling that we did on repeated rounds of social distancing um, uh, uh, in COVID nineteen, and. Uh, and the, the blue bars are periods of, of having social distancing on, and the white is periods of having it off. And what you see is that um, the red is the intensive care demand and the black is the, um, is the number of cases. And so essentially you have to uh, turn back on social distancing here uh, at a time when the intensive care demand is not too bad because 
it's going to keep growing uh, before it gets better. Um, so it's essentially the same problem I mentioned with Wuhan, uh, but in a model now. Um, and it also complicates uh, analysis of transmissibility. Um, uh, this is another example from 2009 where we, where we looked at um, different ways of augmenting the data to try to uh, correct for these delays. Um, and the details are unimportant, but when we were trying to estimate um, the reproduction number, the R0 of that, of that uh, flu, what we found was tens of percents of variation depending on exactly how you, um, how you modified the data to account for our best estimate of the biases. Um, and these may, not, may or may not look like big differences to you, but, but given that this is a question of how much control is required to uh, to stop the data, uh, to stop the epidemic, um, uh, a 40 percent difference is a really big difference. Um, so these turn, turned out to be quite important. One part of the solution that we've uh, that we've contributed to, and others have uh, contributed other approaches to, is this notion of now casting, which is essentially a formal way of um, of say, asking the answering the question. If we know about a certain number of cases today and in the recent past, how many cases will we eventually know about that occurred today and in the recent past? So it's essentially trying to fill in these, uh, these missing data uh, of cases that have not yet been reported. Um, and as it happens, we were working on this software uh, approach um, or this statistical approach and software to do it before COVID came. Um, Sarah Magoo had, had graduated and gone off to um, to uh, an industry job and uh, her bosses at Genentech very generously uh, gave her a week of pro bono time to uh, put all of this into uh, our package uh, that could be used by public health departments around the world as it is now being used. Um, so there are a lot of examples, but, but I think you get the point. The, the, the data, meaning of data changes. <clears throat> the next point I wanna make is is um, that sometimes the most important contributions to policy are just expressions of uncertainty. Um, and this is a, um, uh, a quotation from ProPublica, Pro which did a big story on how uh, different, how New York City and New York State had responded to the pandemic. Um, and they describe this thing, they call it the Lipsitch model. It's, it's, that's very grand. Let, let me show you what it actually is. Um, it's a, we had at the request of New York City created a, a, a shiny app, a, a web-based tool that people could use to make estimates of what, uh, I don't know if this is gonna work, uh, of what, uh, of how many cases there might be in the United States, given the number that we knew about. Um, where is, where is it? I don't know it's gone. Um, well, I'm not seeing how I can share it. Uh, oh yeah. So, um, so what we did was to let people uh, set the, can you see? I think you can see this. It was to let people uh, set what they thought was true of the epidemic spread. Lots of uncertainty at that time and still, but especially at that time about how many introductions there might have been, uh, what proportion symptomatic and so on, and then run various randomly generated scenarios um, in which that uh, those assumptions were made. And uh, so there was not really, this was not deep science. This was saying, we don't know almost any of these numbers, but if you assume certain numbers and assume that the epidemic progresses in certain ways, then you might have very few cases uh, in a few months from now, or you, under the same circumstances with bad luck, might have a lot more cases. And for New York City, that turned out to be a very valuable statement, not because it was scientifically novel, but because it, um, but because it, 
but because it said that not having a problem yet that they could see should not be reassuring. So that there may be a problem you don't see or absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And so only in retrospect was it at all clear to me that this was a useful thing to have done. We did it because we were asked to and it was pretty straightforward to do. But it turned out that this was one of the more useful things I think we did simply to give the warning that um, that uh, things might be worse than they look because of lack of detection. And then the last area I want to talk about is the importance of decision rules. And here I want to go back to something that didn't happen happily, um, but was uh, was de much debated in the early 2000s, which is how we would respond to uh, or prepare for and respond to the risk of a bioterrorist smallpox attack. So the notion was that terrorists may attack us with smallpox and, and the, um, the three choices were that we could vaccinate the whole country against smallpox now. We could, we could do that only after an attack happens or we could use so-called targeted vaccination or ring vaccination, uh, sort of test uh, trace vaccination after an attack to vaccinate the contacts of infected people the way it was done in the eradication campaign. And for political reasons, the first option seemed implausible, although uh, Vice President Cheney was pushing for it, uh, it, it never really uh, became reasonable. So two and three were the two options. And so the assumptions about smallpox were that without vaccination, there would be millions of cases and deaths uh, if there was an attack. But that mass vaccination would lead to almost certain death of a small fraction of vaccinated people due to adverse reactions to the smallpox vaccine that was available then. Um, if we mass vaccinated, it was assumed only few secondary cases would occur because we would have herd immunity, a term that's now in common parlance, but then was still specialized. Um, but the more vaccines we used, the greater the cost. So with trace vaccination, we might, we might do fine, uh, but there's a risk larger than the risk with mass vaccination that it could fail, leading to a large epidemic that killed millions, or infected in millions and killed many. Um, uh, the trade-off then is between the certainty of needing more vaccines with mass vaccination at more cost and adverse events, but a lower risk of a large epidemic. And there were dueling models that were proposed during that time. And, um, and there were all sorts of debates about which parts of the models were right and were wrong and uncertain, et cetera. But I think despite some serious problems with the model that was used by, by uh, Kaplan and Kaplan, colleagues uh, from Yale, uh, I think the most important diagram that was ever made for this question was this one. Um, and I've added some, some pieces to, to re reflect what's described in the text. So what they sh showed is that if you think that there is likely to be a small enough uh, initial attack and that the transmission is likely to be low enough, then the optimal policy is trace vaccination. And on the other hand, if you think that uh, it's likely to be a large or highly contagious attack, then the optimal policy is uh, mass vaccination. But what they pointed out was that um, the, the difference that if you're wrong, the risk of being wrong if you do trace vaccination when you should have done mass vaccination is that you get millions of deaths because uh, mass vaccination would have prevented runaway epidemic, but trace vaccination is inadequate. Um, and the risk if you do trace vaccine, mass vaccination when you should have done trace vaccination is that you have 10 to the two adverse events. And you, we could talk, talk about, there's also a probability in there uh, no, there's not a probability. This is all after the vac all the after the attack. So, so it seems to me that one of the clear messages of this is that uh, while there's a lot of of uncertainty about parameters and the optimal decision, when you think 
about the possibilities and integrate over those uh, possible uncertainties, it's very hard to argue for trace vaccination because the risk of being wrong is far, far greater. Um, uh, another analysis that was published after that in Science uh, made a case for trace vaccination, but using a very weird uh, metric, in my opinion, which is cases prevented per dose. Uh, so it, it's a sort of efficiency metric, but the question is why would we care that much about using a lot of doses if this was stopping a, a large attack? So that seemed to me to be an answer to a question that we probably shouldn't have needed to ask. So I think it was a, otherwise a better model in the, in the science paper. So for this problem, the Kaplan model had lousy assumptions, but I think a better metric of trying to minimize the maximum badness um, or minimize the chance of the worst outcome. Um, and I think the decision rule uh, of, of Haller and Nadal was, was less relevant. So I think some takeaways are that early action is often necessary despite uncertainty. Um, the data are not what we would like, but we have to use them, and that we should use decision analytic principles and not simply scientific principles uh, uh, to, to make decisions. And that really means taking into account the possibility that you, uh, of what happens if you're wrong. Some ways I think we can improve rapid decisions under uncertainty in the short term is to recognize that no decision is permanent Fast does not mean unchangeable, and we can build in points to re-examine and off-ramps. I think that term was coined by, by this, this, uh, this book on the swine flu pandemic that never was in 76. We can invest in lower cost, lower risk preparations now to preserve options for the future. For example, we've advocated preparing for human challenge trials uh, and manufacturing. Others have, have uh, pointed out the need to manufacture vaccines when we're not sure. And we need to respect science, but not always wait for it to be perfect. In the longer term, I think we need to improve our surveillance capacity. We need to improve data sharing across jurisdictions and then bridge the educational gap between the sort of decision theory that we teach in uh, somewhat mathematical and, and uh, specialized classes uh, and public health decision making uh, more broadly. So I will stop there uh, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. And next we'll be hearing from Dr. Winia. And meanwhile, during the presentations, if you have questions, reminder, just plug them into that Q&A box. Leah, what are, you, what are you seeing on the screen? Am I sharing my slide or am I sharing? Yes, I can see We're good? Okay. Looks good. Great. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reflect a little on some of what Mark has said. Um, there are some areas that I might have touched on, but he did such a nice job of describing the uncertainty associated, for example, with estimates of morbidity and mortality in pandemics that I'm going to skip over uh, some of that. Um, I'm going to I'm going to frame this around a few um, a few issues, but I'm going to start with a with a poll question. So um, if we can get the poll question up, and I'll just acknowledge number one, this is a question that other people have already used in the past, and that's why I'm using it. It's not a perfect question, um, and it has an obvious sort of false dichotomy baked in, right? Because um, I think one of the um, one of the real sort of points of frustration for many people today is that um, these were supposed to go hand in hand. And, um, and we made enormous sacrifices as a nation um, and many individuals made personal sacrifices, um, economic sacrifices, um, health sacrifices in order to slow the pandemic so that we could reopen uh, sooner. And the fact that you know we bought time, we bent the curve, we flattened the curve, um, and then failed to take advantage of that to be able to safely reopen the economy is probably one of the places where people are most um, most frustrated today. Looking back on the last six months, um, people feel like you know what we did this back in March and April. We did what was necessary as a nation. Um, and then, and then we sort of didn't follow through um, in the way that we might have. 
Um, I will say the results here are uh, maybe not unexpected, um, given that this is something like uh, a public health crowd. Um, but it's also not that far off from what you get from the general public. Um, well over 80% of people, when given this, this forced dichotomous choice, uh, will choose slowing the pandemic um, over, um, over slowing the economic decline. So let me uh, get started here. I don't have any uh, disclosures to make. I am going to be referring to the two reports, one of which Aaron mentioned at the beginning that Leah was very much involved in, came out um, at the end of August uh, on the evidence base for public health emergency preparedness and response. And the second, um, which I probably won't talk about because Mark did such a nice job of this, but this just came out on uh, Wednesday of this week. Um, and it's a, a framework for assessing morbidity and mortality after large scale disasters. Um, and this was actually uh, a FEMA funded report that looked at um, how do you tally morbidity and mortality. It, it really came out of um, the very discrepant assessments of mortality from Hurricane Maria, where the direct mortality from you know, flying debris and drownings during the hurricane were something like 64 people. But when teams at Harvard and Georgetown did um, more comprehensive assessments, it looked like closer to 4,000 people had died. So that sparked uh, the need for um, some assessment of how should we best count up the number of people who died during disasters. Um, I'm gonna use some historical examples to explore what I call the three R's of ethics and epidemics. And, um, I'm going to avoid the two historical examples that everyone talks about, which is the 1918 pandemic flu and the 2009 pandemic flu, and instead talk about maybe some more obscure um, examples. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time focusing on a few guiding values. These, uh, as I will say, are not the only guiding values, but they're the ones that seem to have gotten the most attention recently, um, and they are certainly very important. Um, I could speak a little bit about research, which I suppose would be a fourth R of ethical considerations during pandemics, but we'll save that for uh, the Q&A. So let me start with, um, with an old pandemic. Um, this is a pandemic that uh, arose in the uh, 10th through the 13th century. It swept through Europe. Many people were uh, affected, mostly in uh, overcrowded, poor communities. Um, people developed patches of skin which would grow uh, and become entirely anesthetic so they could not feel pain in these areas. They would then get an infection and end up losing uh, their limbs. The bridge of the nose would often collapse leading uh, along with a uh, buildup of this bacillus under the skin to what was called a leonine face or a lion-like face. Um, and people with this illness were often segregated into colonies were um, seen to be, so uh, the word that was often used was unclean. Um, so Hansen's disease or leprosy um, was uh, an early example of a pandemic and a terrific example of the ways in which um, people with a contagious illness are stigmatized, are feared, are segregated out, um, and some of the sort of moral panic that can arise around a pandemic. Um, it also is an excellent example of the poor being hit hardest. Um, we had a number of early outbreaks in Colorado that arose in Aspen, in Breckenridge, in Vail, in, you know, uh, Tony uh, Resort ski towns, um, but that's not where it stays, right? And I heard this actually uh, from a reporter from the LA Times who um, who was tracking down, you know, the wealthy residents from Mexico City who came to Vail, got infected, and took it home to Mexico City, where, of course, that's not where it stays. It then goes into uh, the neighborhoods um, where people can't afford to travel to Vail. And she said the si very similar thing arose in Los Angeles, where the first few cases took place in the Hollywood Hills, because those are the people who can travel around the world and pick up a virus that they can then bring home and transmit to uh, the housekeeper and then it's in uh, you know, a different neighborhood, and that's, of course, where the majority of the illness and deaths have arisen. Um, this is not new, and the idea that um, pandemics will affect the poor and will lead to stigma, fear, blame, uh, ostracization, 
Um, the great pox, you may not be familiar with this term, um, but uh, small pox is in contradistinction to great pox. Um, great pox was syphilis. Syphilis in its first iteration across Europe uh, caused a very aggressive disease. Many people died uh, from syphilis in a fairly um, rapid fashion in the secondary stage when giant boils would form on the skin. Um, it has obviously changed in its nature since then, but, um, but great pox uh, was in, in some circles blamed on Columbus. Um, but the reality is every place that had great pox blamed it on someone else. So the Italians called it the Spanish pox, and the French called it the Italian or Neapolitan pox, and the English called it the French pox, and the Polish people called it the German pox, and the Russians called it the Polish pox. So everyone wants to blame uh, a contagious illness on someone else. And this is, again, a, a, a strategy, um, a human response, um, and it is something we're seeing again today. Um, the idea that you can isolate this uh, into islands, uh, just like uh, Hansen's disease, also very similar. And I'll say there was uh, what was framed as a medical controversy in the U.S. over whether it was appropriate to treat people with syphilis. And the argument against came largely from the religious community who felt that you were interfering with God's will that people who developed syphilis deserved it. Um, and that if we saved them, we were just uh, bringing people back from the appropriate punishment from their sins. Um, this level of fear and blame generates, of course, a great deal of interest in protecting oneself. And my favorite story in this regard is uh, the very famous doctor's robe, which was used during the uh, great plagues of Europe in the, uh, in the Dark Ages, essentially. Um, and I love this quote because uh, the, the doctor's robe, the most famous part of it is the beak, of course, which was a hollow beak that would be filled with either herbs or spices or uh, sometimes uh, rags that had been dipped in cat urine. The idea was that something very pungent would prevent the humors from the house getting into you. And so because the humoral uh, theory of disease was the uh, prominent theory at that time. And this priest in Italy complained that the robe, which was associated with this, which was a muslin robe that would be dipped in wax. So it's a very hot, sticky, heavy, um, waxy thing that would drape all the way down to the floor, ostensibly to prevent the vapors from getting in from the room into uh, the person inside. And this priest said this was uh, very uncomfortable and useless against the plague. The only thing it did, did was to protect from the fleas. And this is where I really miss having a live audience because you would be cracking up right now, those of you who realize plague, of course, is transmitted by fleas, but I can't see or hear any of you. So, um, so let me talk about self-protection, which, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Um, so self-protection blends quickly into, cons into questions about restrictions on liberties and how much are we allowed to restrict the liberties of ourselves and others in a democratic community um, in order to protect the larger, uh, the larger community. And this, of course, uh, is an old question. Um, in 1984, there had been a series of countries around the world that had implemented uh, martial law and other forms of very strict civil liberty restrictions in response to uh, ostensible threats from the outside. And so leaders who were essentially authoritarian leaders were using public health and military threats as a way to implement martial law. So a group of lawyers for the United Nations got together and produced what are now called the Syracuse Principles saying that when you're gonna use uh, coercive public health measures, they have to be legitimate, necessary, legal, non-discriminatory, and the least restrictive means. And that uh, phraseology has become very widely used. This sits in contradistinction in some ways to uh, Mark's earlier point, which is really about the precautionary principle, right? And so these sit in balance with each other. The idea that you want to do everything necessary to prevent really terrible outcomes. The more terrible outcome uh, you can envision, 
the more restrictions uh, you can justify. And at the same time, you have to be sure that what you're doing is not unnecessary, that what you're doing is respectful, respectful of individual liberties and rights. This, by the way, very similar to um, the principles in the US Constitution, right? The Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, due process. Um, so the idea that a state can only impose restrictions on its, uh, on its constituent individuals if the state has a compelling interest, if they're using the least restrictive means, if there's a due process uh, for appeals and so on, is very American, in fact, the Syracuse principles are. Um, this principle of proportionality um, turns out to be the, one of the more um, commonly discussed and deliberated and debated in the whole arena of um, pandemic response. It, um, it comes up with regard to restricting liberties, but it also comes up in questions around resource allocation. So for example, when you're performing triage um, and you've got a limited supply of whatever resource, the principle of proportionality um, requires that you do repeated assessments based on a repeated understanding of what your resource limits are right now. Because God forbid you tell someone, we can't give you what you need right now because we don't have enough. And 10 minutes later or two hours later, a new shipment comes in and you don't go back and reassess that person because they've already got a black tag on their toe. And this is, very, this is a very real consideration in disasters, right? So this is Louis Armstrong Airport after Katrina and the DMAT team there actually black tagged a fair number of people as being triaged to receive comfort measures only. But very few of those people actually died because they kept going back to them and saying, you know what, we can now evacuate you. Or we, we've received more resources, we can actually take that black tag off your toe and put a red tag on your toe, right? So, um, so being willing and able and recognizing the necessity of repeated assessment is one of the principal um, principles of uh, resource allocation. So let me put up this second question um, because I know Mark has worked on this. I'm sure Aaron's worked on this. A number of people have worked on this question of um, who gets to the front of the line if there are not enough ventilators to go around. And this became very, you know, very uh, hot topic um, back in uh, March, April, May, even June. Um, about whether or not healthcare workers, um, and keep that broad, right? We're not just talking about physicians here, but people taking care of sick patients in a hospital, should they get some kind of preference um, in uh, prioritization? And this is a hard call question, Leah, um, that we're doing in an episode of our podcast, Hard Call, um, on this exact question, because it turns out to be quite controversial, uh, as many folks around, uh, around Boston and Massachusetts have learned um, the hard way. Um, these questions are not without uh, some level of controversy. And it looks like within this audience, we're looking at, um, you know, a little over 50% who say yes, uh, another third say no. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess closer to 60% uh, or so are saying yes, and, uh, and another third or so are saying no. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. Um, one of the, uh, I'm trying to close this, sorry. Um, one of the mistakes uh, that I think folks sometimes make is to oversimplify the ethics um, the ethics in disasters when it comes to resource allocation and triage. Um, and there's a, a sense sometimes that um, in normal medical ethics, uh, we've got these four principles, we've got, you know, a balancing act that's going on. But in a disaster, in a catastrophic disaster, all of that goes out the window. And the only thing that matters is just save as many people as you can. Um, and that uh, unfortunately doesn't work and is morally uh, fallacious reasoning in my view for uh, several different reasons. Um, starting with the fact that it's really hard to just save the most lives. Um, there are not great metrics to know when you are saving the most lives. Um, and it almost immediately devolves into questions about 
well, are we really talking about saving the most lives or are we talking about saving the most life years, right? So do you give priority to people who have a longer life expectancy in front of them versus people with a shorter life expectancy in front of them? And that can sometimes even devolve into a much more uh, contentious issue of, well, what about the quality of those life years? Um, what about other principles like women and children first, which is really reflective of the idea of saving your community so that the community can live on beyond uh, just saving the most lives? And what about things like, you know, the people who show up first? And what about the ability to pay, which is in fact how we distribute the healthcare resources often in the and the point I want to make is not that one of these is, you know, right or wrong. I, I do think some are more right and some are much more wrong. The point is that there are a bunch of principles that come into play. Um, some are substantive type principles where you might be able to develop a set of guidance around those principles that would tell you exactly what to do. But I think much more important are procedural principles, processes that should be used when making allocation decisions. And that's where the issue of proportionality, equity, transparency, accountability, and so on come into play. And in reality, multiple values are important, even in a disaster. So yes, you would like to try and save the most lives. But um, the way we put it in the Colorado uh, state guidance on crisis standards of care is we aim to save the most lives while sustaining social cohesion while retaining some level of trust in our healthcare system and while preserving the ability of our community to come together and heal in the wake of the disaster. And those types of values matter as well as the desire to try and save the most lives. Let me put up the last question here, which is about, uh, which is blending us uh, away from rationing and into questions of individual liberties. So people who choose today not to wear a mask and they get infected, um, should they be deprioritized in the resource allocation protocol? And this is something that uh, I think Art Kaplan actually uh, wrote a little essay about this, suggesting that this might be a reasonable approach. Um, I will say, uh, you know, consistent with what we're seeing in the results here, about 60-40, um, most folks in the healthcare world, in the medical care world, say, you know what, people do stupid stuff all the time and we don't punish them for it when they show up in our emergency department. So I think when, in the medical ethics arena, the answer to this is relatively clear. Um, in the public health arena, you know, in a disaster, in a resource shortage situation, I can imagine people trying to make this argument. I feel like, personally, I feel like this would be a very difficult sell um, for uh, clinicians who are very used to the notion that we don't punish people for the bad decisions that they make. We don't use healthcare as a tool of punishment. Um, so let me go on to the last little bit here about um, personal liberties and public safety, which Ron Bayer sort of famously back in the 90s during the sort of height of the uh, AIDS epidemic said that the ethos of public health and that of civil liberties are radically distinct. And yet, uh, I think even Ron agrees now that there are um, a number of ways in which attempts to restrict personal liberties can actually backfire and lead to worse outcomes in terms of public health. Um, we talked about this in the Evidence-Based Practices for Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Report, um, which came out a couple weeks ago. And we described the, the fact that people who think they're about to be placed in quarantine, um, or if there's some other sort of public health intervention that is gonna force them to do something, may actually get their hackles up and become increasingly defensive and flee the area. And this is not an entirely, um, you know, sort of a hypothetical uh, response. During the SARS epidemic, there were a couple of very good examples of this. Uh, there was a rumor early on that all of Beijing would be quarantined and 245,000 migrant workers fled the city. Now, if some number of those people had had SARS when they left the city, that would have been a quarantine effort that backfired because it would have spread SARS throughout the countryside. 
uh, we got lucky in that instance. Hong Kong's Amoy Gardens apartment, similarly the site of the first outbreak in Hong Kong, um, it was in fact placed under quarantine and when the police arrived to enforce the quarantine, half of the homes there were empty. So people left rather than stick around for quarantine. And without being stereotypical, I will note that these are ostensibly communitarian cultures where people obey the state authorities. Um, you can imagine what might happen in the United States if a military style quarantine were attempted to be enforced, say here in Colorado, where most people have both an, RU, uh, an SUV and a, and a gun. Um, and this same dynamic, by the way, played out in Wuhan. Um, when Wuhan was locked down, about 5 million people were not there, who, you, who are normally there. Now, some of those had been traveling anyways because it was around the Chinese New Year, um, but some of them presumably fled the city um, to avoid the lockdown. Um, so how could a, a something like a mask mandate backfire in this same way? Um, and I'm not going to say one way yes or no. I will acknowledge at the outset, by the way, uh, you don't have, I'm not arguing against mask mandates. Um, masks are absolutely protective. Um, these are my two favorite uh, pieces of evidence in that regard. There's choir practice in Skagit, Washington, where one person standing way up in the back row infected almost every other person in the choir over a two hour choir practice, none of them wearing masks, of course. And on the contrast are the two hairstylists um, who saw and cut the hair of 140 clients, which by the way, puts them in very close contact, obviously, with all of these clients. And not a single one of the clients became infected um, because they were both wearing masks. They were not wearing N95 masks. You know, these were paper masks and cloth masks. So masks are absolutely, um, are absolutely effective, but forcing people to wear a mask could actually backfire because it's a very visible symbol of your agreement with the government's recommendation or mandate. And unfortunately that turned out to be, you know, sort of how this played out for a while at least, is that people were saying, well, you know, the CDC didn't say it, and now the CDC does say it, and why are they giving us mixed messages? And this is a cabal and you're just trying to, you know, you're just trying to use this public health emergency to infringe on my personal liberties. And I thought uh, Angela Duckworth and uh, Zeke and uh, Lyle Unger wrote a really nice piece um, for the New York Times about how to talk about mask mandates um, to, with people who um, initially raise those kinds of objections. So I'll just refer you to that um, and finish with a reflection on the thing that Mark also ended with, which is uh, the possibility of politicization of public health uh, information. The smallpox vaccine program is uh, an excellent warning of this. Um, there was a, a really nice IOM report about this back in 2005 or six, um, and I wrote an essay about it for the American Journal of Bioethics, sort of summarizing what they said, which was that um, the effort to do broad-based vaccination for smallpox was largely driven by a political effort to drum up support for the war. And the, the CDC and a number of scientists were unwitting accomplices in the attempt to drum up support for the war. And the minute the war got started, the whole CDC, the whole vaccination program essentially stopped with no explanation. Um, and the CDC's reputation was, according to this IOM report, um, harmed as a result because the public and healthcare communities started to wonder, is the CDC part of this political apparatus rather than being the independent scientific and public health entity it needs to be? And I'll just, I'll close with that because I think that is very much at the forefront today. People today are looking at the FDA, they're looking at the CDC, and saying, you know, can we, can we salvage the reputations of these really historically important and critical um, organizations for national public health? Um, and what will it take to salvage and to rebuild the reputation of trust that both of those organizations really deserve and need in order to be effective? And that's, I'll stop. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Winnie. And
Dr. Lipsitch for great uh, introduction to these topics and, and raising lots of good questions. And so as a reminder, if you're in the audience, you can type up your questions in the Q&A box. And we'll try to get to as many of those as possible in the remaining time. But I am going to take the moderator's privilege and start by asking a question I have, um, especially listening to your presentation, Mark, which is that with all of this uncertainty about decisions, and you've both brought up the precautionary principle and, and trying to weigh up harms, on whose side does the burden of proof fall? So if a model is predicting certain harms in the future, is it up to a state governor to refute it and show why they think the economic harms might be greater, for example, or is it on a public health researcher to show that the health impacts will be greater due to the disease than something else? I think there are kind of at least two layers to the question. One is sort of the um, the uh, the decision maker versus the academic, and the other is um, kind of the the knowns versus the the more known versus the less known. Um, and I think I don't have a clear and crisp answer. I think what decision makers should be getting, and I think it's been quite chaotic in this country, partly due to the um, sort of near disappearance of the networks of, of academic groups that were um, that were providing advice on infectious diseases to government, um, and partly due to the fact that there just hasn't ever been a really good integration between those two groups, even when there was more funding. Um, the, the, the path of information has been chaotic, and it would be very much to ask of any state government or even the federal government, but especially state governments, to fully digest all the ideas and all the calculations that are being made. Um, and so I think the process of sort of scientific consensus and uh, bringing in multiple scientific voices from, from each discipline and then across disciplines is important. Um, you know, and in the discussion about lockdowns versus not, which uh, Matt nicely dichotomized in a way with his first poll question, but but in a reflecting uh, a dichotomy that neither of us believes in, and that um, I think much of the Twitterverse does believe in. Um, you know, I think that's a case where the um, where the the successful control of the virus it appears from examples in other countries leads to a better economic outcome um, and where the leaving it to to spread uncontrolled is bad for health and bad for the for the economy um, and what we seem to have done is to do ineffectual lockdowns uh, so we've suffered the economic losses due to the virus the health losses due to the virus and the health and the economic and health losses due to the lockdown. So we've in a way had, because of our chaotic response, the worst of all worlds. Um, so I, I don't have a really good answer except that when, when there was a debate in March about should we begin lockdowns, uh, I tried to frame it very much as we see a train coming at us and we should get out of the way as best we can. That does not mean we should be in lockdown for the next six months. That means we should be in lockdown until we understand better how to respond. And by the same token, we should have been uh, the minute that that the intelligence came that this was a problem, which was early January or at least late January, we should have been making preparations, low, relatively low cost insurance like preparations um, so that so that we could then have a more have more options on the table, and that's really what I mean by what I said at the beginning. With better decision making, leaves us hopefully with fewer ethical dilemmas, because now we're really in a pickle, and I don't I don't even know how to how to put it take it apart. Thank you. Yeah, is I'm straying a little away from your original question, but Mark is raising this. Um, 
this issue of uh, coordination and the sort of chaotic response. And I think the illustration of this is really even back in February and March when the lockdowns were happening, they were happening erratically in different states, right? So Colorado implemented an early lockdown, but we were surrounded by states that never implemented any kind of a meaningful lockdown. Um, and you know, the, the metaphor that I thought best exemplified this was, you know, it's like, it's like having certain areas of the pool where it's okay to go pee. It's not, you know, you can't do that in a, in a nation that is geographically all contiguous and where there's lots of traffic across state borders. Um, having this be a state by state response was just, you know, astonishing. Um, and the fact that we, you know, were relatively effective, even with that uh, <laughs> initial sporadic response, um, and then failed to take advantage of the fact that we did curb spread quite effectively to use that time to get ready, to ramp up testing, to ramp up, you know, mask production, to all of the things that, you know, were in the playbook for how to deal with a pandemic, right? We, we have a playbook for how to manage a pandemic. Um, and we just ignored, uh, you know, a number of those things. And if I could say one other thing about the, um, the known knowns and unknown unknowns and stuff, because I, I think we actually, the biggest risk here is not the one Donald Rumsfeld, you know, famously called to our attention, which is, you know, there are things you know that you know, and there are things you know that you don't know that you don't know. And then there are these unknown unknowns. And he worried very much about those. I actually worry a little less about those and a little more about the fourth box in that two by two square, right? Epictetus actually made this two by two square table. The fourth box is things you know that are wrong, right? The things you think you know, but they are wrong. And that's where we make the wor very worst mistakes, right? So I think that is how we made the you know worst mistakes going into Iraq. But it's also some of the worst mistakes we've made here is by making assumptions about what we knew. And I really loved early on, Mark, you said something about sometimes the, the most value that a model will bring is to demonstrate the level of uncertainty under which we are operating. And, and I, th I think that is really true. Um, models and, and, uh, and public health people in general should be pretty good at conveying uncertainty and, and teaching humility um, and teaching the need to go back and relook at things as we learn more. That's again, part of the proportionality principle. Is, is willingness to revisit that decision, Willing, re, willingness to revisit those data. That's a, a good point and a, a question that's come up and, and touches on something you've both raised is that the recommendations have changed and we wasted some of the time we bought ourselves through these early shutdowns to implement stronger public health measures. And so either as a modeler or in your work in public health ethics and actions, um, what could be done to facilitate public trust in the information that we do have and then the recommendations that come out of it? Mark, you want to go first? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think the first thing is the source. Um, if, if the recommendations come from a, a source that is trusted and that doesn't seem to have a political agenda, and we just heard a few caveats to that at the end of Matt's talk, but um, the CDC for, had regained a lot of credibility. Um, and in 2009 really did, I think, an almost perfect job. Uh, you know, there's some, obviously not perfect, but a really very good job in 2009 of saying every day from the same podium, this is what we know, this is what we don't know, this is what we're trying to figure out. Um, and, you know, people are not dumb. They can understand that that data come in and that ideas change. Um, I think that um, that it's the the changing messages on masks uh, have exemplified the problem. You know the sort of what can go really wrong um, because uh, there is a coherent and explanation of why the message has changed, which is. Initially, we didn't know if they were effective for, uh, for people and they were needed in hospitals. And all things considered, it was better for people not to wear them and so that hospitals could get them. As it became clearer that 
the supply was could be extended and that we were getting benefit, the risk benefit changed. Mm -hmm. I think some people were sloppy in their uh, with important consequences in saying, oh no, it's bad to wear masks and not explaining or saying they don't work rather than we don't know if they work. And um, having the wor <laughs> personally experienced the worst uh, health event of my life due to uh, my own doctor not knowing the difference between absence of evidence and evidence of absence. Uh, <laughs> I try to be very, very careful about that also for reputational reasons because uh, things change and if you say something with too much confidence that turns out to be false, you look like an idiot. Um, so I think I think we just have to, that, that one distinction of evidence of absence uh, versus absence of evidence is, is gets you a pretty long way. It's it takes longer to explain and it's harder to um, harder to uh, to explain to everyone. But but people can understand it and there are people who do risk communication well who can help us <laughs> to explain that better. Yeah and the only thing I would add is that um, honesty about the reasons for the recommendations as well as the reasons why they're changing. I, th I think you can explain to people why things changed. It is much harder to explain if you didn't tell them the reason you were making the decision to begin with in an honest way, right? So we made recommendations about mask usage that were crisis standards of care recommendations that we knew the recommendation was not optimal it was optimal given the resource limitation, right? So, um, so the idea that masks aren't useful or can't possibly be useful, that should have been really not said because we didn't know. What we knew was that we had a shortage mm -hmm. and we were gonna need N95 masks in hospitals and we didn't want the public to use them because there's a shortage and we need them in the hospitals. No one said that. And if we had if we'd been honest about it at the outset and acknowledged that we were making you know, a suboptimal decision, but it's the best we can do given the shortage, it would have been easier to change track later and say, okay, we've got more now. You guys should start using them. And unfortunately, it's just a lost opportunity um, to acknowledge that we were in crisis standards of care. We still, by the way, still today, we are in crisis standards of care with regard to mask usage, right? With regard to mask supplies. We are not today in our hospitals using masks in the way we know to be best. We're using it in contingency mode at, at best, if not crisis mode. We're asking people to carry that mask with you for a week, keep it in a plastic bag overnight, put it on again the next day, right? That's not optimal. That's not how we normally use masks, but we're still doing that because we still have shortages and we're, and we're afraid that we haven't ramped up production to optimal levels. Thank you. And uh, there were a number of questions raised about how to explain what is complex, uncertain, changing data and evidence to the public in ways that we can all understand and affect our behavior. And I think you've both touched on that in your answers about being transparent and honest about the reason for decision making, given such uncertainty. Um, something else that has come up and I want to ask is that Throughout this pandemic, there have been disparities in which communities are most affected by COVID. And Matt, that's something you touched on. And we've seen the people of color suffering a disproportionate number of cases. And so for both of you, how are these types of equity concerns? Are they incorporated into evidence or trying to figure out what might happen next? And how are those playing out in the public health actions you were discussing? You first, Matt. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's huge, right? We, we could easily have spent uh, two hours on that uh, set of topics alone. I think I'll just sort of list the places where they're showing up. Um, there's an enormous amount of interest right now in understanding why we are seeing these uh, large um, disparities, both in um, the rates at which people acquire the illness and 
the relative severity of the illness and the number of people dying. Um, those are contentious conversations because I think many people tend to go straight to sort of biological explanations for why people with dark skin might have, you know, vitamin D changes or genetic differences or some kind of physiologic explanation. And yet, um, you know, it strikes me that it will be extremely unlikely that that's the primary reason. Um, uh, you know, when you think about the level of exposure in uh, communities of color, which, uh, you know, tend to be um, folks who come from more crowded uh, neighborhoods who have to go to work, um, can't work from home, um, you know, are working in public service, right? All of the structural factors that lead to racially disparate outcomes in every domain of medical care. Those are the same factors that are probably leading to these disparate outcomes. And the fact that you can do uh, you know, a multivariable model and show that even after accounting for socioeconomic status and housing and all of these things, that you still see differences between races, to me, that is less likely due to genetic difference between races and more likely due to racism. And that's the impact of living in a, in a community that is racist. Right? So if you're seeing persistent differences between racial groups after adjusting for all of these socioeconomic factors, there are two possibilities, right? One is that one group is genetically different than the other. And I'm not saying that never happens. It certainly does happen. Um, there are examples of that. Um, but it's a lot more common, and I think it's going to be more likely that in the end, when we sort of tease all of this apart, two generations from now after thousands of dissertations are written on this pandemic. Um, what we will have learned is that um, most of that difference, uh, race-based difference, um, was explainable by non-biological, non-physiologic factors. The second way this is really playing out in policy discussions is around triage and resource allocation protocols and whether those protocols should divert resources to communities that are particularly hard hit by this pandemic. And I would say the consensus is leaning towards the answer yes, that, um, that equity is an important value um, and that um, while saving the most lives is critical, it is important to save lives in a way that doesn't rip our nation apart and, um, and that doesn't discriminate against people who are already system systematically discriminated against and at higher risk. So diverting resources into communities that are hardest hit by this pandemic um, makes sense uh, from, a, from a values standpoint for us as a nation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. And I would maybe make two further points. I think one thing about disparities um, is that not only are they an issue of injustice, but they also show us that one can do better, um, meaning that if there is a group of people with better outcomes and a group of people with worse outcomes um, who are allegedly members of the same society, then, uh, then the existence of that better off group means that we could be doing better for the, for the worse off, with the worse, worse off group. Uh, and that's almost a tautology, but I think it, it should remind us that, um, that uh, these causes of disparities are, um, are ones that are potentially fixable. And that relates to my second point that the, um, I've been really struck by an absence of research on, uh, on trying to tease apart really what are the, especially the determinants of greater exposure, um, greater um, mortality and, and bad outcomes after infection by race after our adjusting for other predictors, uh, I agree is very, very compelling uh, evidence of racism as a cause, although there are other explanations that have to be tested against it. But, the, but what struck me and is that not much work has been done to figure out what are the activities and uh, settings in which transmission is a great risk. 
Um, the CDC just published something recently uh, that identified going to restaurants and bars. Um, and that was based on 400 or so cases in a case control setting. I mean, that's a pretty paltry study to be a major thing to come out six months into a pandemic or more than six months into a pandemic. The fact that we have still very limited evidence uh, to say whether uh, the disproportionate exposure of people of color uh, and low income people is due to public transport or denser housing or, uh, or uh, job exposures or what. We have little bits and pieces here and there, but uh, I find that a real lack. Uh, and we've actually published a questionnaire to be used alongside um, serologic studies as one tool to be uh, to be used to try to figure that out. But, but that seems like it should be at the top of the research agenda. And I find it strange that, you know, there's national news stories about a 400 person case control study at this point in the epidemic. Yeah. So uh, two quick things. Why one is- We have to wrap up. Oh, are we done? We are, oh. Yes, we're at the end of our time. Inoculum size. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> want to point. thank you both because this has been an excellent thought-provoking discussion and thank everyone who's joined us today and for your excellent questions since we could keep going, um, but we are out of time. I want to remind everyone the recording of the session will be available on the portal website, portalresearch.org, and we hope you will join us next month for a discussion on drug shortages and ethical issues with that and policies to prevent them. Thanks everybody very much. Thanks Mark, thanks Matt. Thank you both. Thank you.